We are up in Alaska. Michael Parenti and I just got done with a black bear hunt in Southeast Alaska, and it was a blast. And in this video, we're gonna talk about some of the logistics that it required for us to make the hunt happen. So to me, going to Alaska, it seems logistically challenging. There's a lot of things that you have to make happen. And I had the good fortune of being able to come up here with Randy as a cameraman before, which makes it a lot easier. Once you've done it once, it, it makes it so much easier to do. So the, the thing with this hunt is you're gonna be planning way out in advance. You have to apply for this tag almost a year and a half before you're actually gonna be hunting because you're applying for the year that's gonna have the fall and then the following spring. So this way Alaska works, you're applying for it 18 months in advance. So keep that in mind when you're planning, it takes a while. The main things that you have to think about is you're going to Southeast Alaska. It's basically all islands or coastal um, cities. There's, no, there's not much for roads around. So you're flying in via a commercial airline into one of these small towns. From there, you have to get to where you're hunting. And most of the travel to where you're hunting is either gonna be by float plane or by boat. You wanna get your float plane flights scheduled first because you can move around the commercial airline tickets easier than you can a float plane thing. So for this hunt, we decided to go via float plane, which is what I've done in the past with Randy. There's several different float plane styles and they all have different capacities on what you can take. So depending on how many people and how much gear you have, it may take multiple flights or it may restrict your weight, what you can bring. For us, we were going in a pretty small plane. We're going in a Cessna. The weight limit was 700 pounds, including us. So just Michael and I were at 410. So we have 290 pounds left of gear that we can pack. So that's just thinking about that, especially when you have coolers and you have salt to preserve hides, stuff like that. Just something to be thinking about. Also, there's other planes if you fly in a beaver or an otter, you're gonna have a lot bigger weight limits, but you're also gonna have a bigger price tag. Uh, the small plane flight for us was around $500 for the flight in. We took a bigger plane on the way out. That flight was $1,100. So um, think about it, plan ahead, ask the pilots what they charge, what they recommend, what you, I mean, what to bring. Just have a good conversation with, with the pilots before you come up. So obviously you're gonna have to get up here and that's gonna require a commercial flight. So you gotta get your commercial flight. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is there's only so many flights in and out of these towns at a given time. So a lot of them have one flight a day, maybe two flights a day. Um, and also keep in, keep in mind if you're going in on a weekend or weekday, because some of the things that you might need to do, like get groceries or uh, go to the fishing game to get your tag or a lot of times you have to buy a locking tag. You can do this in advance and have it shipped, but it takes a long time. So we usually buy our locking tags when we're up here. But if you do that, then you're gonna have to go to a, a licensed provider, buy those locking tags. I usually call in advance and make sure they have them because sometimes they're out of them. Uh, we have been adding one day at the beginning of the trip and one day at the end of the trip, just planned on getting ready uh, for all of the things you're gonna have to do before. And then also once you get back, you have to get your bear checked by Fish and Game. You're gonna to have to get it sealed. They have to pull a tooth, they measure the skull, they check your sex of your bear, all the stuff. So anyway, you have to account for that and it has to be on a weekday. They're not gonna do it on a weekend. So a buffer day on the beginning and the end. And also when you're going into this, just do, you, you wanna have a good schedule. You wanna have like a timeline planned out in your head. And then also have the realization that that is going to change. It, in Alaska, the weather's unpredictable. Uh, I feel like even a cultural aspect of it is people are just less worried about uh, making everything happen exactly on the hour. So you just know that your flights might change. They might be delayed on Alaska Airlines and then also the float plane flights. Most of the times that I've been filming Randy, we don't fly on the scheduled dates. We don't fly in on the date we're supposed to and we don't fly out on the day we're supposed to. You have those days planned, but just know that they're gonna slide and it's just the way that it is. Like, So if you can at all, plan your trip to be longer so you account for those potential days of, lot, you know, of lost time. I've uh, realized after doing this a few times, it's just better if you're just relaxed and not worried about 
everything lining up perfect. If you go into it with that uh, attitude of just knowing that stuff is gonna shift around and not everything's gonna line up, then you're gonna have a better time. So once you have your commercial airline ticket, you got your plan to get up there, you have all your necessary permits and tags, then you're on the beach in Southeast Alaska, you get dropped off, you set up a camp. We're gonna do a whole separate video on all the gear that we brought up. Um, now you got your travel once you're actually in, at your spot. You know, maybe you can walk around and that is possible at low tide to, to just hunt by foot. But where we were at, we were in a bay and it's super nice to be able to cross the bay. And also traveling on the water was a lot quicker. We have these alpaca pack rafts. They're sweet, they're light. You roll them up super small. You can fit them in a plane, easy. And uh, we figured we'd just paddle around with that. We also had the benefit of knowing that Randy's been here before and there was a lot of bears around. So that was nice to know that hopefully if this area was like it was before, we would get there and we'd have a lot of bears to hunt at relatively close where we wouldn't have to travel miles and miles to find them. Once you have your bears, you're flying out of there. We get back to the town and our first priority was the meat's kind of, you know, it's it's it got a good chill on it, but it's kind of getting warm. We want to get ice on it. We want to get it frozen, ideally. And I'd heard about a spot and everyone kept recommending this, this place to get your meat frozen. Uh, and so we went there and they said, nope, we won't do that. We were able to find another cold storage place that we could get our meat frozen. Uh, but the moral of the story is call in advance, figure out a place that you can get your meat frozen to fly home. Because in theory, and you're supposed to have your meat frozen solid to fly. I've, been able to get away with it not doing that before but in theory you're supposed to so you want to get your stuff frozen uh, in order to fly home uh, you, we brought a cooler we brought several coolers actually but there's also a lot of these small towns have uh, what they call fish boxes they're just like these insulated boxes that fit inside cardboard and they zip tie them up uh, definitely utilize those too it's probably more inexpensive because you don't have to fly them up you're only flying them home uh, so if you can again call ahead figure out if they have that as a as something that you can buy up there um, freeze your stuff, put them in that, and you can fly back as checked luggage. So weirdly, we found one cold storage place to freeze our meat, another cold storage place to freeze our hides. We had to go to two different spots. We're gonna have our meat in a cooler and we're gonna have our hides in fish boxes on the way home. Again, an added cost just to be thinking about is gonna be all of those checked luggage items on the way home. It adds up, it does get expensive. Another thing that we're gonna talk about more in the gear video, but just uh, you're gonna to wanna to have a communication source with the, the rest of the world, whether that's a sat phone, a lot of people have Garmin inReaches now, or I had the Zolio. So super handy to be able to text the pilots and get it, you know, we were out of cell service, so we could just text them get an idea of what's going on when we're going in and out, uh, have clear communication, um, also to check the weather and stuff. So that's just how we did it. There's a lot of different ways that you could do it. It, it seems daunting, but it just, it's really not that bad. One of the biggest takeaways I have to say is to don't be afraid to call people, call the pilots, call fish and game, and then you'll start to feel out how everything's gonna work together to make your trip happen. Uh, it's not that bad. You're gonna have a blast. Come up here, enjoy this awesome landscape, and kill some bears, catch some fish, have a good time. Be sure to check out the gear video. We're gonna have that up as well to talk about all of the gear that we brought for this particular hunt. Thanks for watching.